Hello everyone, this is Lucas Coffier from the New Japan Technology Transfer Help Desk. Welcome, this is June 28, 2019. It's Friday afternoon in Tokyo, it's 5.05. Uh, so, good afternoon for those that are here, good morning for those that are in Europe. And welcome to webinar number 28, on June 28, on patents, patentability of software inventions and AI, with an overview of legal systems and recent trends in Germany, Japan, and other European jurisdictions. Today we have uh, two speakers, as you probably saw from the, uh, uh, the flyer that we made, circulated and from where you registered. Uh, as usual, just let me introduce the help desk with my um, email address so you can contact me, send me an email whenever you want, asking questions, uh, sending me comments, um, just be in touch, free fleet, uh, to do so. You also have the website here of the help desk, which is uh, an additional uh, website compared to the one of the uh, center itself. You also have the link to the survey for SMEs that we always run, and you can also find a box on the webpage of the help desk's website, and you can click on that and take the survey online. And also, finally, the last link that you see here is to register to the newsletter we send out every three, four months an electronic version of the newsletter where you can find all the latest technologies that we have in the database, all the latest trends, events, reports, previous webinars, future webinars, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, today uh, speakers. We have Sarvajit Patil from Sonore Kobayashi here in Tokyo, and we have Dr. Robert Berner from Murgitroyd in Germany. I would like, as usual, just to give you a short bio uh, of the speakers so that you know uh, who is going to talk to you and what is their background. So in the case of Savajit, he has been a New York State licensed attorney law and a U.S. registered private attorney since 2011. He received a bachelor's degrees in computer science and economics from Carnegie Mellon University before attending Vanderbilt University Law School, where he was also an editor of the Vanderbilt Journal of Transnational Law. Sarvajit so practiced intellectual property law in New York before moving to Japan, and then he joined Sonoda and Kobayashi in 2018, where he focuses on Japanese national phase prosecution of electrical and mechanical inventions. He speaks English and Japanese. Then we have Robert. Uh, Robert is a constant uh, fellow of the Help Desk. Already gave many lectures and also here in Japan. So I'm very happy to introduce Robert. And Robert studied general physics at the Technical University of Munich, completed his PhD studies at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Brussels, where he research on chemical reactions on metal surfaces under a high vacuum. Uh, Robert is fluent in German, English, and French. In 2001, he started his training as a German and European patent attorney in a mid-sized Munich-based German patent firm, which he completed in 2005 by passing the German and European qualification examinations. Then he joined Mortgage in 2011 to build up and lead the German office and was appointed Director of Patents and Trademarks in 2013. In addition to his experience in patent prosecution and litigation on various technical fields, Robert also has a wide experience in matters relating to trademarks. He regularly travels to Japan to enhance the cooperation with local clients and partners by presenting seminars about European and German patent and trademark practice. Without really further ado, I'm really glad to introduce the first speaker. And the floor is yours. Sarvajit, welcome. Yeah, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Sarvajit. You can call me Sarv, and uh, I'll be handling the Japanese side of this presentation today. Uh, we have a lot of really interesting material to get through, so why don't we jump right into it. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to be uh, talking about patentability requirements and the legal basis thereof. We'll talk about subject matter eligibility and examination guidelines. Then I'm going to go into a lot of case examples of AI-related inventions in Japan. And finally, Robert is going to talk about protection of AI-related inventions in European jurisdictions. So first, let's talk about patentability requirements and legal basis. First up, Japan. Let's take a look 
at the requirements here, and you can see the usual suspects, novelty and inventive step, industrial applicability. Of course, when you're talking about software inventions, you're going to take a particularly close look at patent eligibility or a statutory invention, basically eligible subject matter. And then finally, we're going to take a look at uh, clarity, enablement, support, which I'll generally refer to as the written description requirements. And we'll see that uh, the Japanese patent office's attitude towards software inventions has been generous on eligibility, but strict on inventive step. So first, let's take a closer look at the legal basis for um, patents in Japan. First of all, an invention in Japan is defined as the highly advanced creation of technical ideas utilizing the laws of nature. And that's the key phrase here, utilizing the laws of nature. So does software fall under this? Well, according to a 2002 revision of the Japanese patent law, yes, it specifically points out computer programs as perhaps being uh, patent eligible under the definition of working. And a computer program means not only directly a computer program, but also an electronic computer equivalent to a computer program. So there is some flexibility in how you define this. Uh, now, uh, Robert, will you please tell us about uh, patentability in uh, Europe? Hi, good morning. It's Robert here from Murgatroyd Munich. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Well, in the European Patent Convention, the legal basis for software and patentable inventions is Article 52, as most of you will know. Um, just a side remark, uh, you will notice that SARFs in my foils uh, and slides are very full with text, uh, but we will run through them and get you to the most important points. But we thought it's better to give you an overview here, and then if you take the material at home, you can read everything in detail if you like to. Um, well, Article 52 of the EPC, um, especially Paragraph 2, um, will have the exclusion for patentability according to the European Patent Convention. And that is um, in 2A, mathematical methods, which are important for artificial intelligence. We have in C, the programs for computers, and we have in D, presentation of uh, information. Uh, so these things as such are excluded from patentability in Europe. And uh, this exclusion is, however, according to uh, Section 3 of Article 52, limited only to the, um, well, specific methods, computers, programs, or presentations of information as such. So that's an exception of an exception. And um, if you have to define what's meant by uh, such an exception, uh, well, it's usually case law which decides that. And therefore, in Europe, we have the EPO guidelines for examination, which are based on uh, the case law. And in uh, respect to the exceptions for patentability, um, the guidelines well, clearly state that the invention must be of a technical character, must relate to a technical field, must be concerned with a technical problem, and must have technical features. Uh, to solve the problem. And, um, well, as you can see, technicality is really the main issue here, and that's something similar to uh, Japan. Um, the subject matters of the acti or the activities listed in the Article 52, if you take them as such, are considered to be non-technical. And if you have a claim in Europe which contains a mix of technical and non-technical features, examiners will identify um, which features have, uh, well, contribute to the technical character uh, of the invention, and only these features will be taken into account when discussing inventiveness. However, um, features that appear to be non-technical uh, may contribute to the technical uh, character in the context of the invention. Well, in, in, in Europe, um, what has been established with software invention is the so-called two-hurdle approach. I won't go into detail here now, but um, the first step to overcome uh, to get a software application or computer-implemented invention granted is to have the eligible subject matter of technicality, which is usually easy in Europe. And then inventiveness has to be assessed only on the technical features, and that as seems to be similar in Japan, is the main issue if you want to overcome the patentability hurdles. And um, to go more in detail, I'll uh, switch back to SAR for the Japanese part, and I'll 
give you a uh, broader overview of the guidelines uh, and what has changed in the recent uh, months and years uh, after Sarf has finished his Japanese part on that. Okay, let's take a closer look at the subject matter eligibility and examination guidelines in Japan. Okay, as we stated before, uh, an invention is defined as a highly advanced creation of technical ideas utilizing the laws of nature. So this, with this key phrase, utilizing the laws of nature, does software qualify? Because software, unlike a hardware-related invention, uh, is not directly linked to the laws of nature. So there's been a lot of discussion about how it should proceed in Japan. There's been a lot of revision of the law and the guidelines to accommodate for software-related inventions. And this is where we stand right now. Uh, first of all, the uh, claimed invention as a whole must utilize the laws of nature. And uh, if the invention is fully regarded as usual, utilizing the laws of nature, regardless of whether the invention includes computer software, then it is a statutory invention. And some examples of this uh, are, for example, inventions that concretely control an apparatus or process, such as engine control, or inventions that concretely process information based on technical aspects of an object, such as uh, uh, image processing. And um, when you have some uh, examples like this, you don't even need to get too deep into the software-specific tests because these deal with physical objects. So as we'll see in the next slide, um, we, can see, we can see a slide, um, a, a flowchart here, of generally how software is determined to be subject matter eligible in Japan. Uh, the examples I gave before are the leftmost box saying, uh, for example, a method of controlling a machine or processing data representing physical, chemical, or biological phenomena or structured data. These would tend towards being eligible subject matter. On the other hand, when you have uh, a man-made agreement, language, mathematics, psychology, or data per se having no reference to hardware or data structure, that is not likely to be subject matter. And when it can't be determined which of these categories it falls under, the key test is whether or not the characterizing part of the software cooperates with the hardware. This is the key test. So if you have software cooperating with the hardware, then it's more likely to be eligible subject matter. And if you don't have this, then it's less likely to fall under um, eligible subject matter. So, for example, some uh, examples of unpatentable subject matter would be a program list, which is not a technical idea, a program language, which is not considered to utilize the laws of nature, and uh, actually a program signal or data signal is considered to lack clarity in Japan because it cannot be determined whether, a product in, whether it is a product invention or a method invention. Now, getting back to the examples from before, uh, an invention concretely controlling the apparatus, something that would be found to have subject matter eligibility, here's an example of how you might write such a claim. Um, you want to include, of course, cooperation between hardware and software. Um, for example, here we have an apparatus for controlling uh, the rate of fuel injection, and you'll see that there are software steps of detecting the rate of engine revolutions, detecting the transition of the rate of engine revolution and determining the rate of fuel injection. However, for each step, we're also going to try to include the specific hardware element that is acting on the software. For example, here you have the first detector means, a hardware element, for detecting the rate of software, the uh, rate of engine revolutions. You're going to have another hardware means, a second detector means, for detecting transition of the rate of engine revolution. And you're going to have a hardware means, a fuel injection rate decision means for determining the rate of fuel injection. So you can very clearly see here the cooperation between hardware and software. Second example, this is uh, an invention concretely processing information based on technical aspects of an object. This is image processing. And here, if you just take a look at it, sure, there is a, a, a matrix here. It looks like math. However, if you include recitations that show cooperation between software and hardware, then it can fall under patentable subject matter. For example, you have image processing. You have inputting uh, this matrix. However, it is picked up from an optical reading means. You're um, picking this up from an actual physical image, and that tends towards subject matter eligibility. Now, when you have something that appears to be purely software, such as a computer software for business, computer software for games, computer software for numerical processes, which are created totally utilizing computer software, then you really have to stress the cooperation between software and hardware. 
And if the information processing by software is completely realized by a hardware resource, this invention is deemed to utilize the laws of nature. And this is in particular if an information processing apparatus or methodology is concretely constructed by cooperation of star, uh, software and hardware resources according to the purpose of use. So not just a token use, but if this is central to the use of the invention, that's where the software and hardware cooperation really counts. Now we can see a classic example here. You have a formula, and this formula it appears to just be math. You would think perhaps this would not fall under patentable subject matter. However, we're going to look at the specific purpose of this invention, and that is the calculation of m times n in an 8-bit CPU without a multiplier or a multiplication table. So you're specifically choosing which hardware elements you're going to exclude, which ones you're going to include, and suddenly the hardware elements you're choosing become a central part of this invention, and we can clearly identify the cooperation between hardware and software. So these four steps below that just include the steps of the algorithm, we're not going to claim just that. We're going to claim the hardware elements as well. So as we can see here, we're going to include the means for inputting, a hardware element. We're going to include the square function table, which is a hardware element. We're going to include uh, arithmetical means for comprising an adder subtractor and a bit shift arithmetical unit, and means for outputting all these hardware elements in addition to the software steps, the arithmetical steps. And that together demonstrates a cooperation between the hardware and the software. And the use of hardware in this case is central to the invention. So in this case, the claimed invention is a statutory invention. It can be said that the information processing by software is concretely realized using the hardware resources depicted below. And here's some more examples of demonstrating the cooperation between hardware and software. Of course, when you're dealing with 3D printing, you are dealing with a physical, real thing, and that tends towards being subject matter el eligible. However, when we draft these claims, we also want to demonstrate, as strongly as possible, the cooperation between hardware and software. So we have 3D printing data used in a 3D printer. Cooperation right there. We have model materials, supporting materials. These are all real physical objects. And we can see that they're also software elements such as uh, material data, material pointers, but these are going to interact with the control unit of the 3D printer. They're going to interact with the storage portion, and we can see very clearly that there is cooperation between the hardware and the software elements all claimed together. Another example here is a trained model here for analyzing the reputation of hotels. This would take written uh, reviews of hotels and try to aggregate them all together and determine through a neural series of neural networks um, a combined aggregated score such as three stars out of four stars. And we're going to see whether this is patentable subject matter or not. It turns out this was found to be patentable subject matter. First of all, this trained model was determined to be the equivalent of a computer program because it does cause a computer to function in a certain way. It includes instructions, and so it was determined to be the equivalent of a computer program. Further, we have cooperation between the hardware and the software elements because all of the weights of the neural networks were stored in memory, they were processed by the CPU, and the hardware and the software were found to be cooperating together, thus satisfying the eligibility requirements. Uh, now, Robert, would you please tell us about uh, guidelines about computer-implemented inventions in Europe? Well, thank you, Sar, for that uh, uh, very tour de force through your examples, but I think otherwise we don't get through the text with all that. Um, in, in Germany, no, and especially in the European Patent Convention, as I said, the EPO guidelines are the, uh, well, means to look at if you uh, need some guidance how to uh, claim software patents. Um, interestingly, the EPO, um, they already acknowledged the importance of computer implemented inventions and artificial intelligence. And uh, you can see that, that the EPO guidelines on the website, they have a specific um, index for computer implemented inventions. So if you go to the website of the EPO and you look for the guidelines, on that site uh, with the index for computer implemented inventions, you will get all the different sections and paragraphs and uh, items of the guidelines which are related to uh, computer implemented inventions. 
And the further thing um, which the EPO does in order to acknowledge the importance of computer implemented inventions and software and AI and 3D printing and Internet of Things is that they uh, agreed to update their guidelines once a year with respect not only to computer implemented inventions, but uh, as a, in, in a general uh, view. And the guidelines are updated usually now in November. And there has been an update uh, on the 1st of November 2018. And I will give you some more background about the updates with respect to computer related uh, inventions. Um, in the guidelines section dealing with mathematical methods, there has been an update on the section about artificial intelligence. Um, there have been an update about simulation, design and modeling. Um, there have been updates uh, relating to methods for perf performing mental acts, playing games or doing business, but I won't go into detail here. I just name them. Then there has been updates uh, which are quite important, and that's section 3.6, programs for computers, and the subsections, examples for further technical effects, and also information modeling, activity and programming, and programming languages has been entered in the guidelines in 2018 and which is not written in bold here but which i will also discuss is a data retrieval formats and structures because it was also just entered into the guidelines in the recent update so let's start with the update uh, concerning programs for computers just um i think it's important to note that the epo as a general um they are of the opinion that the basic patentability considerations um, apply as well to computer programs as to other subject matter. In order to overcome the hurdle of the non-eligibility, um, the technical character of the claimed subject matter has to be shown. And there, in the guidelines, there's a lot of examples in which cases such a technical character has been uh, found to be present and the application has to be allowed. Um, and I think uh, what's the most important criteria in uh, the European Patent Convention is that in order to have a technical character, a computer program must produce a further technical effect. And that is an effect that which goes beyond the normal physical interaction between the program and the computer on which it is run. So the, the circulation of electrical currents in a computer is not sufficient to render the feature or the claim uh, technical. And uh, as, a, as a consequence, uh, you need to have um, a technical character which is not only present if you have a computer program which is designed to be automatically performed by a computer. You need more than just finding a computer algorithm. And as I said, these further technical considerations may need to be reflected in the claim features and that cause a further technical effect. Um, examples for such a technical effect, and these examples are updated on a regular basis according to the case law at the EPO, are for example just um, compressing video, controlling an anti-lock braking system in a car, encrypting electronic communication, processor load balancing, implementing security measures for protecting boot integrity. All these examples are deemed to have a technical effect uh, and will such, as such be uh, considered when regarding inventiveness of the, uh, uh, yeah, the claimed invention. Um, I think for the programs for computers, um, there has not been so much of a substantial update in the guidelines. It's more or less that they include further examples, which is the, uh, which subject matter may be deemed allowable. Um, quite interestingly, I think is the next part, which is about artificial intelligence. AI um, got its first section in the guidelines back in 2017, and it was updated in 2018. And what's quite interesting, um, usually the EPO is of the uh, well opinion that our AI and machine learning are based on computational models and algorithms. And such models and algorithms per se are abstract mathematical nature and irrespective of whether they can be trained. And they, therefore, usually um, 
the guidance provided in the guidelines with respect to mathematical apps, uh, mathematical uh, yeah algorithms apply to AI as well. And the guidelines also interestingly give some examples about keywords which the EPO usually um, well doesn't deem to have a technical character and that's keywords like support vector machine, reasoning engine or neural networks. And um, to be honest, in my view, there have has not been a lot of case law on AI at the EPO at the moment. And therefore, the examples provided in the guidelines are not as exhaustive as it has been for computer implemented invention, in which the case law has been uh, well evolved since the last 20, 30, 40 years. So in AI, there have been some cases where the technicality of the uh, invention has been approved. That's, for example, the use of a neural network in a heart monitoring apparatus for the purpose of identifying irregular heartbeats or a classification of digital, digital images um, based on low level features like pixel attributes or edges for images. No technicality was found for, well, just classifying text documents uh, in respect to the textual content or also classifying abstract data records or even telecommunication network data records without any indication of a technical use being made. Um, what the EPO also states in the guidelines is that uh, where you have a classification method in AI and which serves a technical purpose, usually the steps of generating the training set and training the classifier may also contribute to the um, technical character of the invention. So as I said, there's more case, la case law needed to further build the guidelines with respect to AI. And um, this may turn out a bit problematic in the future because many people, um, they refrain from filing appeals once their application has been rejected by the examining division. But without appeals, the Board of Appeals may, uh, may not uh, issue well further dis decisions and uh, pushing the case law further. And additionally, maybe the new um, rules of procedure for appeal proceedings um, we will also well, scare off people to file appeals, but it would be too far uh, to go into detail here. Um, the next update of the guidelines um, refers to the simulation design or modeling, and that was an update in 2017. And usually, um, claims which direct to a method of simulation, design, or modeling, um, well, they usually fall under the category of mathematical uh, methods and they are excluded. Um, if, however, parts of the simulation are computer implemented, then you may have the technical character and then you at least overcome the eligibility issues. But then, um, you have to well argue well why the uh, features have a technical effect. And um, in this context, um, the well the purpose of the simulation is important because if you, for example, uh, simulate a marketing campaign or uh, administrative schemes for transportation of goods, well, that doesn't represent a technical purpose. And therefore, the simulation um, will not be regarded as having a technical contribution to the invention. And a generic limitation, such a, a simulation of a technical problem, will not help you to overcome the issues here. And based on that, um, general points, they also have uh, decisions about when uh, simulations, designs, or models uh, have technical character. And that's, for example, if you have a, a CAD program, computer-aided design, and you have the determination of, the, of a technical parameter, which is linked to the functioning of the technical object, that is technical. Or if you design an optical system by a CII method, and um, the use of a specific formula for determining technical para uh, parameters, that may be technical. A, and also, if you have a determination of iterative simulations uh, to find out the maximum value that a parameter of a nuclear reactor may take without risking rupture of a sleeve due to stress, that's technical. However, if you just implement a method uh, to well result, resulting in an abstract model of a product, e.g., you have a set of equations, that's not technical. 
And if you have, for example, a method merely specifying how to describe a multiprocessor system in a graphical modeling environment, that's also not regarded to be well, technical. Um, the next part of the guidelines, which has been introduced in 2018, and therefore is also quite interesting to have a look at, is information modeling, activity of programming, and programming languages. And as you can see, I start with technicality no. So it's a very restrictive section uh, because the EPO regards information modeling to be an intellectual uh, activity devoid of technical character. The specifications of a modeling langu language lack technical character. Um, the maintenance of models also not technical. Conceptual, conceptual methods describing the process of software development not technical. Reading data type parameters from a file as input to a computer program, not technical. And this list goes on and on. Uh, even if you define and provide a programming language um, like object-oriented programming, uh, which enables the programmer to develop a program with greater ease, this is not, not technical. Easing the intellectual effort of the programmer is per se not a technical effect. So it all breaks down to technical technicality wherever you look at the EPO. There are at least two examples where you may have a technical character in this uh, section. And if you have the uh, information model only to be used in the context of an invention to solve a specific technical problem, or if you have a, a use of a relational database technology um, to store the model, this may render your um, well, modeling invention to overcome the technical hurdle. Um, the next point, and I think that's, oh, no, there's uh, two, well, it, it's, it's the last point of the updates of the uh, guidelines in 2018. And this is maybe the most interesting point. Um, it refers to data retrieval formats and structures. And that's new. That's completely new uh, because the EPO starts to make a distinction between functional data and cognitive data. Well, so far, if you have an invention dealing with data at the EPO, um, well, the EPO just said, well, data is data and it doesn't matter what's the content of the data. So um, if you have a, a uh, invention where you transfer data from point A to point B, well, that will always lack novelty because that's done by computers since centuries. No, well, almost a century, no. Yeah, 80 years, doesn't matter. Uh, so that's lacking novelty. However, now they may uh, make a distinction between functional, functional data. And this, this is data which serves to control the operation of a device processing the data. And the other part is cognitive data. That's data whose content and meaning are only revel relevant to human users. And as can be seen from this distinction, functional data usually contributes to produce a technical effect because it inherently comprises, reflects corresponding technical features of the device they are controlling. Whereas cognitive data does not contribute to produce a technical effect. So to give you two examples about that, um, one is, for example, if you have a record carrier for use in a picture retrieval system, and that uses coded pictures together with a data structure. Well, the data structure defines the line numbers, addresses, and they, these instruct the system how to decode and access the picture. This data structure is regarded as functional data. The content of the stored pictures, pictures of a person or landscape, this is cognitive content, only be relevant for humans, and it has no technical effect. Another example for functional data is an index structure used for searching a record in a database. And if you have an email and you have a header and a content section, according to the distinction between functional data and co uh, cognitive data, you have the information in the header this is regarded to be a functional data because it comprises instructions which are automatically recognized and processed by the receiving message system. However, the content in the content section, the information, represents usually cognitive data and therefore has no technical character. 
So with this distinction between, um, well, functional data and cognitive data, the EPO goes in the right direction. But again, we need case law, how to shape that into the right form. And um, I think in the end, with all the, uh, well, computer in implemented invention and AI and Internet of Things, we may need to end up in a solution where we regard data to be something like a flow of electrons and of course then having a technical effect. But as I said, we need more case law to see what is regarded as uh, functional data in this context. So a brief summary about the EPO. Um, they apply the known technicality principle to computer implemented inventions and AI. And um, they consider computer implemented inventions in NI to be treated according to the same considerations and prerequisites as they have done for computer implemented inventions for the last 30 years. However, they start to accept that, uh, well, our world is moving faster and faster and uh, the developments in uh, CII and AI are so fast that um, they, they have to change some things and uh, on the other hand, they remain quite strict with respect to granting patents in that sections of, uh, in the fields of CII and AI. Um, the question is, as I said, functional data definition is a step in the right direction. Is it sufficiently clear? We don't know. We'll have to see and wait. So the question remains um, how to protect AI in Europe and I think I'll give some ideas after uh, Sarf has now commented on the Japanese side on these issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for those updates from Europe. And now I'm going to get into some of the updates to the JPO case list. Um, these are all from the past year, and they provide some insight as to the written description requirements and the inventive step requirements. So let's uh, get into this. First of all, I want to uh, get into very briefly some of the clarity requirements. Uh, computer software can be claimed in the form of a method, a program, a structured data, computer readable uh, data storage media, etc. As we said before, the definition can be quite broad. Other expressions such as module, library, neural network, support vector machine, model are acceptable as long as they're clearly understood to mean computer software or hardware. Although finally, uh, expressions such as a product, a, pro a program product may be deemed as lacking clarity. Okay, so now I'm going to get into some of the uh, JPO case examples. These are all available in English from the JPO website. I encourage you to take a look at those and read them in more detail. Right now, I'm just going to get into the basic holding and uh, compare them to some of the other cases with similar fact patterns. First of all, we have this case involving a sugar content estimation system. In this case, uh, the inventors tried to use uh, an AI to establish a correlation between a farmer's face, like pictures of a farmer's face and their facial features, and the sugar content of the fruits and vegetables they produced. And this was deemed to violate the enablement requirements for two reasons. First of all, the specification of this application didn't specify precisely what facial features you're looking for and how those facial features might affect the sugar content of your crops. And the second reason is that even though this was not in the specification, further, it was not known in the art uh, generally. So one of ordinary skill in the art um, would not know how to draw these correlations, wouldn't know what to look for, and would not be able to practice this invention. So naturally, this was rejected. Now let's compare this to the next case involving a business plan design apparatus. In this case, you have an AI that uh, attempts to analyze uh, advertisements online, and based on those advertisements, try to determine how much of a product a business should keep in stock, whether that stock should increase or decrease, and by how much, based on the advertisements. And in this case, um, there was no specific correlation between the advertisements and the change in stock based on, uh, described in the specification. However, in this case, it was determined that uh, someone of ordinary skill in the art would be able to draw these correlations themselves. And therefore, even though it wasn't specifically described in the specification of the application, because these things were sort of well known in the art, it didn't need to be. And as so, there was no reason for refusal found. The written description requirements were satisfied. A similar case 
involves an autonomous vehicle. In this case, you have an autonomous vehicle that can switch between an automatic mode and a manual driving mode. However, before going into the manual driving mode, the, uh, the car would take a picture of the driver and based on the features of the driver in this picture, would try to determine whether the driver is ready to drive and try to assign a score of how ready the driver is to drive. Now, in this case also, um, no specific details were listed in the specif specification determining which features would affect the score and by how much, the score of how ready they were to drive. However, once again, in this case, it was determined that someone of ordinary skill in the art would be able to determine these features for themselves. So even though the features weren't specifically listed in the specification, this was nonetheless found to satisfy the written description requirement because one of ordinary skill in the art would be able to figure things out and fill in the gaps. Okay, now let's uh, turn our attention to this body weight estimation system. This system attempts to predict someone's body weight depending on uh, an image of their face and also information about their height. And in this case, we have two claims. Uh, claim one was rejected, but claim two was allowed. Claim one just generally stated that based on the height and their general facial features, you'd be able to predict their weight. Um, this was found to be too broad since there was only one specific feature listed in the specification. That specific feature was the angle at their chin. And claim two actually claimed this. So claim two specifically claimed the feature that was specified in the specification, that the angle of the chin is the key factor in the facial image that would determine, help determine someone's body weight. And so claim two was allowed because it was specifically spelled out in the written description. However, claim one was too broadly generalized based on only one piece of information in the description. So this was, claim one was rejected while claim two was allowed. On a similar note, if we take a look at this case regarding the allergy incidence rate, um, we have claim one, which was rejected, and claim two that was allowed. Claim one just generally said that based on a change in the shape of someone's cells, you could determine whether they had contact dermatitis. However, claim two specifically pointed out that the change of shape would be one of a change in ellipticity, rugosity, and oblateness. And based on these three features, which were specifically described in the specification, you could predict whether someone had contact dermatitis. So claim two was allowed because these three features were specifically identified in the specification. However, these three features by themselves were not enough to broadly generalize to any change in the shape in the cells. So claim one was rejected as being too broad, but claim two was allowed because it was very specific as to the features you needed to look for to draw the proper correlations. And uh, last among the written description cases, we have this case involving an anaerobic adhesive composition. In this case, we have an AI model that predicted a certain composition would have certain properties within five minutes after curing. Um, the problem with this is that this product was never actually made. It was never actually tested. And so the specification just based this um, conclusion only on the AI model without ever having produced the product predicted by the AI model. And this was found to violate the support and enablement requirement because there's really no way of knowing if this uh, composition actually had the claimed properties. So this one was rejected as lacking support. So to sum up the written description cases, um, correlations should be supported in the description or at least known in the art, but preferably, of course, disclose as much as you can in the description so it's not up to the examiner's judgment whether someone ordinarily skilled in the art can fill in the gaps. Uh, claims should not be generalized or overgeneralized, I should say, beyond the features specified in the description. Otherwise, you'll have cases like the cell case or you can have cases like the body weight case where just generalizing based on one or two or three particular features will get rejected by the examiner. And finally, if you predict something, if you predict an actual product or if you predict something with an AI model, you should, if possible, try to test the actual results. Otherwise, the examiner may uh, reject this claim as a lacking support or enablement. Okay, now let's get to inventive step. Of course, we have the usual factors for determining inventive step that apply to any field, any art. 
But specifically in terms of computer science and computer software, we want to consider that one of ordinary skill in the art not only has ordinary skill in software, but is also skilled in the specific technical field that you're trying to apply the software to, because of course, everyone's trying to apply software to their particular field. Now let's take a look at the case involving a cancer level calculation uh, AI, a trained neural network, that tried to determine someone's cancer level based on two markers in their blood. This was essentially based on a method that was well known to be manually performed by a doctor and nothing else was added. So this was rejected as being a mere application of an AI to a well known method. This was not enough to have an inventive step. Let's contrast this case to the hydroelectric generating capacity case. Now this is one of those cases where two claims are listed. The first one was rejected and the second one was allowed. The first one um, was basically trying to predict the hydroelectric generating capacity of a hydroelectric power plant based on several factors of the water upstream, which was based on a formula that was well known in the art and nothing else was added. This was determined to be a mere application of AI to a well-known formula in a well-known art, and so claim one was rejected. However, claim two added the factor of upstream temperature to this calculation, and this was not previously known in the art, and so because this was new and it added a significant effect to the previously known formula, it was determined to have inventive step. Let's contrast that case to the screw clamping case, which involved trying to analyze the quality of a screw clamping procedure. This uh, collected a bunch of different factors for determining the quality of screw clamping based on different sources. However, between these sources, all of the factors were well known. And because it was simply an aggregation of well-known factors, although the factors were from different sources, this was determined to be a mere aggregation of data. It was not determined to be inventive over the prior art. And the final inventive step case involved determining the dementia stage of a patient. Uh, the way a doctor would do this is a doctor would conduct an interview with the patient, and then depending on the patient's responses to various questions, the doctor would assess the level of dementia that this patient had. Now, the AI system basically did something similar, except before training the neural network, the data would be processed by dividing the topics of the, uh, the doctor's questions and the respondent's answers into these different topics, and then based on the separation of topics, training the neural network. And this was determined to have inventive step because it was different from the prior art. This classification of questions and answers into different topics was determined to be inventive over the prior art, and so it was found to have inventive step. So to summarize these inventive step cases, mere application of an AI to human operation or a known method is probably not enough to uh, have inventive step. However, if you, for example, add training data that leads to a significant effect to the prior art, that may have inventive step. Also, in the previous case, we found that pre-processing of training data for machine learning may also have inventive step over the prior art. Okay, and now Robert, would you please tell us more about how AI-related inventions may be protected in various European jurisdictions? Thank you, Sarf, for handing over again. Um, I think what you can see from the examples Sarf just presented on the Japanese side, Japanese um, case law is already much more established with respect to AI as than it has to be the case here in Europe. Well, let's have a look why that may be the case. Well, usually if you have an AI or deep machine learning, you have the core AI, that's the algorithms. You've got the machine learning, the training of the algorithms using respective data, and you have the AI as a tool, that's the application, i.e. the application of the trained algorithm. So what's the problems here uh, by protection by patents in, in Europe? Well, first of all, algorithms as such are not patentable. Then, according to our experience, algorithms are often published by the authors uh, because they belong partly to the open source community or they have their personal pride to publish their um, found algorithms. And another thing with AI is that these most mainly or often based on known algorithms. And I think um, that is an issue because algorithms as such it's not easy to protect by a patent in Europe. So if you have um, the machine learning as such, 
it, this may be patentable if you have a technical effect that can be shown. However, I think a problem is that uh, you need a lot of data um, to well train the, the, the algorithms in an AI. And this data in many cases represents the actual commercial value of the company. Uh, because if you want to uh, have the AI be trained on medical images, you need the images. And um, you have to train them somehow. And this data, however, is not necessarily uh, functional data. So the data as such is not easily protected in Europe as well. And on the third level, well, the outcome of the machine learning, well, if you have an AI trained and then it puts out a machine code of five gigabyte, well, not easy to protect that as well. And finally, who is the inventor of such a uh, software produced by deep machine learning? So all these are issues which lead to the, um, well, conclusion that it's not easy to protect AI in Europe. Uh, and I think Japan, shows that it's easier to get a uh, AI application granted for the G JPO. So what are the um, options for people in Europe? Well, in many cases, the only option seems to treat the algorithms, the data, and the outcome as a trade secret. And this is uh, one option which became much more attractive um, because recently the EU trade secret directive had been adapted into national law and that provides means similar to claims which uh, arise from patents. So if you treat your AI as a, a trade secret and someone violates the trade secret, you can also claim damages. You can, uh, well, cease and desist requests uh, based on, 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 on the trade secret violation. This is just one option. And I think we, we stand with the problem of course, if you keep it as a trade secret in Europe, um, at the same time you file it in Japan as a patent, well, after the publication of the Japanese patent, uh, you don't have a secret anymore. So we will see uh, how to solve that situation within the next years. So a very, very brief um, follow-up with uh, national jurisdictions, AI and CII here in Europe. Let's start in France. I just run through that. Software is usually protected by copyright and as with the EPO, computer programs as such are excluded. And also similar to the EPO, it's the uh, technical character, uh, character which is important and a further technical effect is necessary to have a valid invention. And interestingly, the uh, French guidelines for examination, they give uh, claim drafting formats uh, for computer programs, which are listed below. But on the other hand, um, you have um, the, the validity of such claims being directed to computer programs as such are not uh, regarded to be valid um, by the French jurisdictions. There is some court decisions which say that computer program claims as such cannot be valid. Um, however, it is admitted by uh, French practitioners at the moment, but this may change in the future again. And it would also make sense to have the jurisdictions in the different uh, national European countries to be aligned somehow. In the UK, nothing specifically changed with recent developments. It seems to be a little bit more restrictive in the uh, UK to get a software patent allowed than with the EPO, if that's even possible. Apparently in the UK it is. In Italy, um, we have the situation that there is no real examination and the EPO case law is followed. You know that if you file an Italian application, it's sent to the EPO for search report and opinion, and the applicant must, must reply. And there have been no recent milestone decisions on uh, software and CI uh, I inventions by the Italian courts. Finally, Germany. Also, software is protected by copyright. Similar to the EPO, the German Patent Act excludes um, programs for data processing units as such. And according to the German Patent Act, any invention must lie on a technical field, technological, uh, in a field of technology. And um, the teaching claimed by the invention must comprise instructions for the solution of a specific technical problem by technical means. So this sounds all quite similar to the EPO. And um, 
Similar to the EPO, there has been an update in the examination guidelines, which are less regularly in Germany than it is with the EPO. That was in January 2019. And that was for the first time that they mentioned mixed claims. You may recall that at the EPO, we have mixed claims with technical character and non-technical uh, features all the time. And um, now that is coded in the German um, guidelines as well that mixed claims as such are allowable, but non-technical features are not considered during examination. According to our experience, it seems that it's somewhat slightly easier still to get a software patent in Germany granted. So um, if you well consider a, a borderline patent application to be filed in Europe, and you're not sure whether it uh, will be accepted by the EPO, you may consider a national German filing. And I think that's all for now. We stayed within the hour, so Luca will be happy. And I hand back to Luca for finishing off the webinar. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, you were amazing because it's exactly six <laughs> here in, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, we went through a lot of stuff. Uh, hopefully, everybody uh, got everything uh, you, you were very clear uh, to me so I would probably give a minute to um, to the audience to formulate maybe a, one question unfortunately we don't have that much time because we have to leave the room but at least we have time for one question in the meantime if you see the chat window I said <clears throat> that as usual you will get a notification email from um, from Eva probably uh, about the video and the presentation. They will be indeed available for download as a PDF of the presentation and video. You can watch it on our YouTube channel. So having said that and giving 60 seconds to the audience to formulate one question, I have I do have one question uh, for you for you guys. I was wondering if there are any uh, sources where you can have some statistics about the, uh, let's say, the, the rise, potential rise, I guess, in terms of filings of AI-related uh, applications and patents? Well, um, there are statistics issued by the German and, uh, Patent and Trademark Office and by the EPO, but most of these statistics only say that we have a huge increase in uh, AI related patents uh, to be applied for. However, there are no statistics available uh, how many of these are rejected and how many of these are accepted. So, so far, according to my understanding, such uh, statistics are not yet available. How's the situation in Japan, Sarf? Oh, yes, we think that um, in Japan, there, there are databases that do have such uh, statistics. However, you do have to be a member and have to have a payment uh, subscription to be able to access this data. So unfortunately, we don't have them on hand. But uh, I, do, I do believe they are. OK, sorry, Robert. Thanks much. Uh, I don't see as of now any question from the audience. So probably everything, which is good, was really clear. Uh, as I said, everything will be distributed, published, so you can re-watch the webinar, you can share it, hopefully, and, and download the presentation. Uh, I would like to thank Sarv and Robert again, and uh, also Eva in Brussels, and in any way, all the colleagues that contributed to this uh, amazing material that you, you guys created, and the presentation, and uh, I would love to know and think that we can do it again in the near future. And um, I would like to say goodbye, good evening, and uh, end of good morning <laughs> for uh, those that are in, uh, in Europe. We will probably see online with the next webinar after the summer. <laughs>